The News Run on Off The Ball with Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. This is News Talk. Welcome along, Wednesday evening. Busy Premier League evening ahead. Man City in action, amongst others. Updates across the show. Plus, on the football show, Ollie Holt of the Mail will chat all things Wayne Rooney. Ollie did a really interesting interview with Wayne Rooney ahead of his Amazon Prime documentary release this week. So, Ollie Holt talking all things Waza after nine o'clock. We'll also talk to Laurie Whitwell about Manchester United, where, uh, well, not much is changing, is the short story. Chris Jones of the BBC, Rory O'Connor on Wednesday Night Rugby After 8. And then this hour, Super Bowl fast approaching, we have got Jim McMahon, a legendary figure in NFL history, Super Bowl winner with that very famous, much-loved Chicago Bears team of 1985. He was uh, the quarterback. He was kind of a rebel without a cause type upstart. That was the perception, certainly. So an interesting character. And he's on the way this hour. 53106, the text number. We are at Off The Ball on Twitter. Richie McCormick, good evening. Evening, Joe. And we have Ronan Mullen with us. Hello. Hi, Joe. You dreamed all this up. Dreamt all this up, I suppose would be the correct uh, grammar. Jim McMahon, I wasn't very familiar with Jim McMahon and you got in touch and said, I've uh, reached out to Jim McMahon. I think he'd be a good chat. And you weren't kidding. So... Very famous figure. If you were an NFL fan in the 80s in Ireland when NFL was first starting to appear on television screens, you could not miss Jim McMahon. Quarterback, uh, motorbike, bandana, played to the crowd, defied convention, a little bit rock and roll, uh, drinking beers at his very first press conference as a Bears player. He would do things like he'd have a glute injury and the press would be shouting over at practice, how's the glute injury? And he would turn around and moon them. He was a regular on the late night talk show. So he was a big deal and a very famous man. Ten years ago, diagnosed with early onset dementia as well, which we'll uh, chat to him about. So uh, this was uh, in his time in particular, Ronan, very famous man in the NFL. So a nice week to get him and you uh, somehow got hold of him. Yeah, and like so few men have quarterbacked a Super Bowl winning team so it is quite cool to have him on this week of all weeks and you know as you frame it very well there you know in his moment in the 80s he was like arguably the most famous or infamous uh, American sports athlete you know full stop he had that um, as this ascending team the Chicago Bears you know made their way to their first ever Super Bowl championship in a sports mad city he was very much the marketable element of that and you know the front facing part of it like a, as the decades have like worn on that team is now known you know the the byword is the defense because it was the greatest defense that's ever played the game and to that end i would say jim mcmahon and the contribution of the offense has lost its, a bit of its sheen and you know he might allude to it in the interview but the Bears that year were the highest scoring team in the conference. So this was a team that was very well built on both sides of the ball. They went 15 and one, but by all accounts, they were, they should have gone undefeated. It was more of a mishap than anything. They're one of the most fearsome teams to ever play the game and, you know, off the field. And as you alluded to, you know, perceptions possibly don't equate to reality when it comes to Jim McMahon, because often there's like mitigation for all the stuff that he was known for, like, he was known for his headbands and, you know, um, the commissioner at the time was telling him, don't wear those. Pete Rosell was his name. And Jim McMahon basically wore them for impractical purposes in the same way that like rugby players wear scrum caps. It's like to protect their ears. And he had similar concerns with the NFL helmet. So that's why he wore those. And then similarly, he wore sunglasses everywhere. And people were like, who does this guy think he is? He's just wearing sunglasses, uh, you know, like that biker look. And similarly, like that, that was originated from like an injury he got as a child when playing cops and robbers or something like that. So there's kind of a, he is an explanation for most of these things, but at the root of it, you know, just a very compelling guy. And, you know, people might be surprised given how we framed his character in the eighties that he's now a very considered thoughtful person and, you know, speaks very well on his own health issues and how they're emblematic of problems in American football at large. And, you know, I think it's a, it's a pretty interesting chat. He led the charge really in, 2011 12 territory when it came to the lawsuits against the NFL. So he's been very involved in that whole area. Yeah, he, uh, his eye doesn't dilate. So apparently he had a fork and he was trying to fix his broken toy. And in the way the kids can, a uh, fork slipped off the toy and went straight into eye. 
And so that caused him problems, as you might imagine, and hence the sunglasses. Now, so that, you know, there is mitigation. That said, mooning the entire press as they mm. ask you about your glute injury. I, do, I think there's a degree of he had a certain disdain for the press and treated it all as nonsense. And so I watched a bit of a documentary about him in advance of the interview. And there's a whole bunch of people who say things to the effect of, Jim was an ass and Jim didn't care that he was an ass. And so he just kept acting like an ass. You know, so I don't know how you feel about a person like that, but he had that kind of quality to him as well. So he's on the way this era. That's Jim McMahon, two times a Super Bowl winner. He was a backup to Brett Favre when he won a Super Bowl. But in particular, in 85, he uh, led them the whole way there. And he was kind of a fearless quarterback as well. He would uh, dive head first. There was no uh, hitting the deck early and sliding and, and taking a knee when he was in possession. So Jim McMahon on the way this hour, Rory O'Connor and Chris Jones on the way after eight o'clock and then Wayne Rooney up for discussion after nine. Amazon Prime documentary released on Friday. Ollie Holt interviewed Wayne Rooney. It was in the Sunday papers where Rooney was talking about this unquenchable rage almost which uh, dogged him his whole career and talked about as well going on drinking binges alone almost when he had a few days off at Manchester United he found uh, not surprising in hindsight Rich he found the adjustment from 16 year old nobody to 16 year old superstar whose public and private life ended up all over the papers you know really from the age of 16 Uh, needless to say he found that difficult for quite a long time it was a very very fast when you look back on it rise almost you don't want to say out of nowhere but in terms of the public perception definitely out of nowhere because there wasn't a sense with Everton uh, like there was with say like Raheem Sterling at Liverpool whereby there was a youngster coming through and there was whispers about him and then he had a couple of years there and he had moved on from there with Rooney like the first most people had heard of him was that goal against Arsenal and then the next thing most people had heard of him is that Manchester United are offering big money and have succeeded in offering big money to buy him and to have to cope with that at a very young age like to barely be an adult in technical terms is just is mind-boggling and it's it's no surprise unfortunately that he's he kind of I guess lost his way a little bit and lost his way down towards uh, drink and that would have had a, an impact on him but you know an incredible career in the numbers uh, don't lie whatever people's perceptions of Mar. I mean he's England's top goal scorer and will be for a while and yeah, an incredible player on his day. You just wish that day could have lasted a little bit longer and been a bit more consistent. Yeah, very much so. I think they're the thoughts of Ali Holt to some extent or other as well. So he's on the way after nine. And then we'll talk to Laurie Whitwell about Manchester United. The short version here, Ronan, is they're still pretty terrible and nothing much is aligned at the club. The thinking there, I mean, they're on the cusp of handing Pogba a new contract. They've no idea if the next manager wants a problem like Paul Pogba on half a million, for instance. That's just one of about half a dozen very serious issues they have yeah and I think that Pogba one does sort of typify the the broader malaise at the club and absence of you know definitive thought processes and granted they've like recalibrated the admin side of things Edward were departed as of a few days ago I think so you know that um, the new face of Manchester United quote unquote is in motion so to what extent Ragnick will actually have any you know, sway in future decisions will probably be determined by his success as coach for the next couple of months. But, you know, he's done a decent job of possibly highlighting, uh, like very coldly come from the outside and looked at things and possibly, you know, giving uh, crystallization almost for L- other people at Man United who, who haven't had fresh eyes for a while. And, you know, the personnel is the main problem. They have several players out of contract and those need to be addressed chiefly Pogba but also the likes of Jesse Lingard so um, and also there's no sure thing in the next managerial appointment like it seems to have been whittled down to Ten Hag and Pochettino but there are natural misgivings about both of those as much as I like Pochettino he's definitely not a, a proven winner and you know we again mitigation for how he hasn't succeeded in Paris but you know at the same time <laughs> an incomparable array of talent possibly assembly line up front that's never been seen before and you know they're not running away with the league or anything like that and then Ten Hag seems like the real deal but the um, the Dutch league is very different to a hugely competitive like managerially stocked um, Premier League so again two two good appointments in theory but we don't know in practice yet No Well Laurie Whittle on the way 
between 9 and 10 on the football show. We should start the news round as ever. It's brought to you by Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Richie, the latest on Kurt Zuma, who was uh, roundly booed at the game last night at uh, West Ham's home stadium. Yeah, and West Ham say they've fined Zuma the maximum amount possible at the club, which is believed to be two weeks' wages or a quarter of a million pounds. The defenders' cats have also been seized by the RSPCA after a shocking video shared of him online kicking and slapping one of the animals. West Ham drew intense criticism for the decision to play Zuma in last night's Premier League game with, Wa- with Watford. The club say his fine will be donated to animal welfare charities and he's extremely remorseful, but that hasn't stopped Adidas cancelling their sponsorship deal with the France International. I think Dan made, uh, McDonald made a good point last night, Ronan, where he was saying, OK, look, you'll find him a few wa- a week's wages and he'll get back playing and this ultimately will uh, drift out to sea a touch. You know, people can only stay angry about these things for so long. Uh, the real price maybe for Kurt Zuma is that he will now forever be the bloke who kicked a cat. Yeah, and like, I remember like 24 hours ago, you guys were having the conversation and, it, and he was just being named in the West Ham team and... Like 24 hours on, it does feel like the repercussions are starting to catch up a bit with the indiscretion and certainly the public mood where it was like chronically misjudged by Moyes. And I have some sympathy for Moyes in particular because that decision shouldn't have been in his hands. You know, it should have been a, a decision at club level. And as far as David Moyes is concerned, two fit centre halves besides Zuma and his currency is points on the board in the Premier League. And this is a must win game if they have any prospect of getting Champions League football. So. Do you know, like he's been through the mill enough as a manager to know, you know, it doesn't take many bad results in the track to, to scupper your prospects. And if his best available centre backs available, he should he should pick him. But do you know, we'd like to in an idyllic world, we'd like to think David Moyes would have more principle than that. But I think if you put yourself in his shoes, he probably made a decision that a lot of Premier League managers would have made. Yeah, the owners of the club should have stepped in, I think, and taken that decision out of his hands. I was listening to Talk Sport this morning and Jim White had a line through to the West Ham owners and they said, I, I, I presume they're talking about the win, that they were vindicated was the word they used in their decision to allow Zuma play. And you really got to wonder what world they're living in if they consider the last 12 hours a sense of vindication. Yeah, and it's, it's not going anywhere either. And I think the, the, um, or the inclusion last night rather than the omission just exacerbated things and as I said like the dominoes are starting to fall now in terms of West Ham's club punishment which you know within the parameters they have is is as severe as it can get and then you know the trickle down of his sponsorship and so on like that's not going to end today so and to Dan's point he will forever be associated with it's the most high profile thing that's happened in his career and he'll do well for it not to be so going forward yeah I would think so so Richie, and I must confess, I wasn't entirely sure this tournament was on until yesterday. <laughs> um, the World Cup final is upon us. Yeah, you can watch it on E4, Joe. That's that's how high profile it is. Uh, right. It's on the uh, younger son to Channel 4. Uh, but Chelsea are through to Saturday's Club World Cup final in Abu Dhabi. Romelu Lukaku's first half tap-in was enough for a 1-0 win over Asian Champions League winners Al Hilal of Saudi Arabia in Abu Dhabi. Chelsea will play Palmeiras in Saturday's final. What's E4 showing these days? Still friends non-stop or? It's, oh God, what's the Big Bang Theory is a lot of it. Uh, yeah, Young Sheldon, yeah, which yeah. is the prequel. Um, so you can watch like Young Sheldon, Big Bang Theory, uh, whatever reality show they have on from the UK and then some sexy Club World Cup action. Yeah. This tournament just doesn't... Great spot. Used to be a great spot for Big Brother Live, but uh, those days have oh, come yeah. and gone. Oh, well, <laughs> Halcyon days, Halcyon days. Scrubs repeats. Yeah. No, those were the days now. Those were the days. <laughs> Big Brother Live when they were talking about something personal and therefore they blocked out the silence and you still watched was I think a low point for a lot of uh, my generation I think uh, this tournament just doesn't capture the imagination Rich does it? No it doesn't um, and especially seeing it as it, is, it has been because it used to be just get the European champions get the Libertadores champions send them off to Japan and have them have a one off match and come back home and nobody cared about that then People care about this even less, it mm. seems now. And um, yeah, like, but it's all a money making exercise, and it's no surprise to see Mr. Infantino front and center at these jokes. Mm. Isn't it funny? Isn't it funny that United put their house on this being a success back in '99 or stroke 2000 yeah. and said, you know, the World Club Cup is going to be a massive thing? I don't know if it was called that, or it might have been a, a secondary tournament to that one that they were actually competing in. But 
they basically said into a new millennium this is going to be the big thing in 20 years and it's actually had a two-pronged uh, effect whereby it, that competition hasn't gone anywhere and it also kind of killed the FA Cup T- Absolutely, I mean the FA Cup would have died but it definitely hastened the demise Yeah, so it's just in retrospect I don't think that's an element that's possibly captured in the the demise as you say like Man United are often pinpointed as the origin of that but the fact that the club World Cup hasn't kicked on in any meaningful way and there hasn't been any suggestions that it will mm. um, so that was a misfire from the United chief execs and so on My memory of that Manchester United World Club World Cup whatever it's called is they got out there realised it was impossibly hot and so just relaxed and there were just pictures of them playing head tennis on, on the beach. On the beach. Cobra Cabana. Yeah. Cobra Cabana. That was the And then getting, <laughs> and then getting the hockeyed by a brilliant Vasco da Gama. Vasco da Gama, Gama yeah. I think Beckham got sent off Mario. again, actually. Beckham yeah. got sent off. It was like, oh, 98 all over again. Although it really wasn't. <laughs> yeah, Edmundo and Romario played up front. I think Gary Neville had an absolute stinker in that match as well. Um, right. But that was like, that, that Vasco da Gama was, was great crack. But I think Phil Vick, or Tim Vickery has, has raised the, the, the issue before. I think South American sides do take this pretty seriously. And there is a bit of cachet attached to it, like in the same way that like Peñarol would have done back in the eighties, or or Flamengo, etc., when they beat Liverpool on a couple of occasions. But on Independiente, but the European sides like don't really care, uh, especially when it's just Premier League ones. And the others like Al Hilal and uh, etc. have no chance of winning the thing, so they're just long for the the payday and the jolly up. First time so play, Phil play and Tim Vickery have been confused as well, I would think. Like it would be so cool if um, River played or Boca Juniors who ever came to. You know, Stanford Bridge. You know that would be a very marketable thing, but as it stands, it's not not a very appetising prospect. No. They used to play the um, they used to play the European Super Cup as a double header. I remember when United won the Cup Winners Cup, they played Red Star Belgrade, and that was a home and away affair. Uh, I think the 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 tie in Belgrade, given the nature of the year, it might have fallen by the wayside. But they definitely played Red Star at Old Trafford that year in, in 91, 92. So there could be scope to do something like that again. Uh, no one cares. None of these things worked. <laughs> None of these things worked. No one cared. Uh, Jim McMahon, that's taken me back. Legend, says Peter in Cork. He's on the way this hour. So Premier League this evening, Richie, busy enough? Yeah, Manchester City can re-establish a 12-point lead at the top of the table tonight. They play host to Brentford elsewhere. Win for Norwich at home to Crystal Palace would lift them out of the relegation zone. Adam Ida once again starts up front alongside Temu Puki for Norwich. Tottenham can move level on points with fifth place Manchester United and still have games in hand if they win at home to Southampton. Matt Doherty is on the Spurs bench tonight. And there's an 8 o'clock start at Villa Park where Aston Villa uh, take on Leeds United. Now, Winter Olympics... Yeah, Seamus O'Connor says a poor takeoff on his second run cost him a better placing in the men's snowboarding halfpipe. He finished 15th overall in what was his third Winter Olympics. Meanwhile, Tess Arbe moved from 55th after her first run to 48th overall in the giant slalom skiing. Shamrock Rovers are happy. Yeah, they've welcomed the decision to overturn the stadium ban that was imposed for fan disorder. Their opening game of the season with UCD was set to be played behind closed doors due to some of their fans setting off fireworks last season at the RSC. Instead, the hoops fine has been increased to €5,000 and fans will be allowed to attend next Friday's game with UCD. Right decision, Ronan? Ah, yeah, and it's kind of at a critical point where creds are being allowed to return, it would, would not be good optically, as bad as the optics were of the original incident, but for the champions to be coming out to an empty house, you know, on opening day, it wouldn't have been a good start to the season. So even from my uh, non-dispassionate point of view as a Dundalk fan, I think uh, it probably arrived at the right conclusion, I'd say. Mm. Now, to general acclaim, from what I've seen, Richie, Sligo Rovers have taken a stand. They will no longer be accepting sponsorships from gambling companies, they say. Uh, such deals could have a detrimental effect on their fan base, according to a statement released today. Draw United took a similar step last month and Sligo say they've recently turned down two large sponsorship offers from gambling companies, Dundalk and Rovers. Are, uh, Shamrock Rovers, that is, are the two clubs in the top flight that do have gambling sponsorship deals on the front of their jerseys. The new season had its official launch today with the President's Cup taking place on Friday night. Uh, there have been criticisms about the lack of a season pass this year on L. TV and the number of live games on TV. League of Ireland director Mark Scanlon though insists the TV remains a priority. 
Definitely. I mean, we're continuing to speak with broadcast par partners. Uh, obviously, we have uh, RTE involved uh, for the men's league in the Premier Division with 15 live games this year and three games in the FAI Cup. And then across in the Women's National League, we've got TG Carr with nine more live games this year, increasing from what they done last year, which was huge, and, and RTE Sport again covering uh, the Women's Cup final. So, so there's a massive amount of TV coverage uh, that we will have this year, but it's something we do want to continue to increase and we want to be able to, to bring it to a wider audience. But uh, in the meantime, the streaming product that we'll have with LOI TV will ensure that, that fans will be able to see every game uh, throughout the course of the season as well if they can't make it but you know we want to see uh, bums on seats as well we want people in grounds uh, obviously that's you know adds to the, the atmosphere we've seen that during the pandemic that it wasn't the same without fans so you know first and foremost we want to see grounds full um, and then secondly you know we want to make sure that we, we increase the coverage across uh, all areas of broadcast but TV would be a, a core priority for us You're both League of Ireland fans I mean it strikes me when Mark Scanlon says, for instance, take the men's league, 15 games across the season is a massive TV footprint. That's, that doesn't ring true, I wouldn't think. Or, yeah, it's poor. You, you, you would expect one game every round, yeah. uh, which would be, what, 30-odd 30, yeah, 30 games. Um, like f Having 15 takes you back to the days when ITV used to show uh, Division One coverage from England, and it would be like every third week, and you mightn't get a live game until October, November. Uh, into the season that's a, there's a similar package here and the clubs get nothing for it um or let, like you know close close on nothing it's up to the fai to kind of uh, it, it, it's a circular process because they have to make the league a more attractive prospect for television uh that will cost money in and of itself and then they need to go and uh get the best possible deal from tv companies or another service because we're in a kind of a, a modern world so there's not just terrestrial tv to look out for here um but they need to find the best way about this because at the moment the, like it's not great and the, a little fact as well like the, the lack of a season pass has put a lot of people off LOI tv this year i know the numbers on it weren't necessarily brilliant to begin with in terms of of uptake but there were a lot of people who put down their 50 euro 55 euro for the season and then watch whatever matches they wanted to whereas now they seem just from anecdotal stuff on twitter less inclined to to dip in for the fiver here and fiver there or yeah. whatever it would be for individual games so if these little things kind of within the fei and within the league of Ireland, they don't necessarily help themselves okay fellas we're out of time thanks so much richard mccormick cheers Nice one. Ronan Mullen, thank you. Thanks, lads.